Uh, thank you so much for joining us. It is my great uh, privilege to introduce our speaker this afternoon. Uh, Roberto Gonzalez is the Richard Perry University Professor at the University of Pennsylvania with appointments in the Department of Sociology and the Graduate School of Education. His research focuses on factors that shape and reduce economic, legal, and social inequalities among vulnerable and hard to reach youth populations as they transition to adulthood. And since 2002, Professor Gonzalez has carried out one of the most comprehensive studies of undocumented immigrants in the United States. His landmark book titled Lives in Limbo, Undocumented and Coming of Age in America, is based on an in-depth study that followed 150 undocumented young adults in Los Angeles for 12 years. Lives in Limbo, uh, an extraordinary book, has won eight major uh, book awards, including the C. Wright Mills Award given by the Society for the Study of Social Problems and the American Education Research Association Outstanding Book Award. It has also been selected by a number of universities as a common read text and has been used by dozens of school districts and community institutions to train staff. And the book was recently optioned for theatrical production, so we are eager to see uh, its many afterlives. Uh, Professor Gonzalez's other books include Within and Beyond Citizenship, Borders, Membership, and Belonging, and undocumented migration. In addition to publishing his work in top, very prestigious scholarly journals, he has also written opinion pieces for the New York Times, Washington Post, Boston Globe, and The Guardian. An active public scholar, Professor Gonzalez has advised a, a broad range of stakeholders in the private and public sectors, has briefed members of the US Congress, has testified on matters of immigration policy before the US Senate. And at Penn, Professor Gonzalez is the founding director of the newly formed Penn Migration Initiative, a university-wide effort aimed at advancing and promoting interdisciplinary scholarship and intellectual exchange around issues of immigration policy and immigrant communities. Prior to his appointment, at Penn, Professor Gonzalez held faculty positions at Harvard University, the University of Chicago, and the University of Washington. Uh, Professor Gonzalez, what a, what a joy and privilege to introduce you. I want to say welcome to Penn, and thank you so much for helping us launch the public events for this year's Forum on Migration. And thank you, thank you all uh, for joining me remotely. I'm, I'm really grateful to the Wolf Center for its flexibility and grace and providing the opportunity to do this remotely. Um, you know, I know that, uh, um, that we would much rather all be together and have all of this behind us, but, uh, but, but here we are 18 months in. Um, this is my first talk at Penn and as a faculty member, and I'm incredibly honored to join this vibrant community um, and also to be kicking off um, this year's foreign, uh, Forum on Migration. Um, so my talk tonight is a slightly different title, um, DACA Dualities and the Limits of Semi-Citizenship. I want to talk a little bit more about that. Um, so I want to share with you this evening um, some work in progress on, on the, uh, my new book that I'm writing with two former students, um, Ben Roth, who's an associate professor at the University of South Carolina, um, in, in social work, and Christina Brandt, who is a newly minted PhD and assistant professor at Penn State in rural sociology. Um, Christina is also the coordinator for my seven-year DACA study. Um, so following up on, uh, on the 12-year study that I carried out for my book, Lives in Limbo, um, we set out to learn in, in real time the effects of widened access and deportation relief through DACA. So I'd spent 12 plus years um, on the research for Lives in Limbo, following young people um, and 
10 years before that um, as a youth worker in Chicago, working with immigrant families. And so I'd spent a lot of time thinking about the ways in which blocked access um, um, and exclusion um, uh, really narrowly circumscribed the lives of, of young people. And so it was a, I felt it was really important when, um, when President Obama announced DACA to study the effects of, of widened access. Um, so we had undertaken a very ambitious mixed methods, multi-sided longitudinal study. Um, we surveyed nearly 2,700 uh, young people and our research team spoke to nearly 500 um, DACA beneficiaries across three waves, so, so three separate interviews. Um, and we, we had learned so much about the changes that DACA beneficiaries were making in their lives to their new access, um, due to their new access. And so for many of them right away in short order, they had acquired driver's licenses, they had obtained employment that matched their education. Um, they had improved their financial circumstances. They had um, obtained better living arrangements. They purchased new cars. Um, those with children now had great, greater financial flexibility um, to enroll their young ones in, in daycare programs. Um, DACA beneficiaries had, had also experienced enhanced feelings of security, belonging, and overall well being. Um, they were able to support their families, and, and those who obtained DACA in their teen years were able to gain access to these benefits on time with their peers, smoothing otherwise turbulent um, transitions to uh, late adolescence and young adulthood. Um, so becoming documented came with sharp improvements over most areas of their lives. Um, as such, DACA has been hailed as a, as a wide success by, by many Americans. Yet, um, as DACA offered the opportunity to recast educational and career goals, its inclusionary power was limited. So beneficiaries uh, remained ineligible for federal financial aid. Uh, for college, their DACA status did not offer them any pathway to legalization. Um, and they, at all times, they risked having their their status rescinded, uh, leaving them deportable. Um, so we, we set out in late 2019, early 2020 um, to write this book. And then in March of 2020, um, the, the pandemic hit. And so like many others, um, probably on this call, uh, we're a bit behind on our work. Um, for me, um, this last year was a little more than a little overwhelming. So I've got a kiddo, so virtual learning uh, for my kid all the way through April, um, getting used to Zoom and, and teaching uh, oversubscribed classes, um, while also trying to um, support the evolving needs of my students at Harvard and, and staying on top of my, my other work as a faculty member. It was it was a challenge, um, to say the least, to, uh, to keep up with this. So beginning in January, I, I started reading books, uh, mostly novels. I, I needed some additional anchoring amid the chaos and uncertainty uh, of COVID. So I set a reading goal of 53 books for the year. I wasn't getting too far on my own book, so I thought that this might help me feel more productive. Um, who knows, I, I might even find some inspiration or a fresh way to look at my books, to look at, at my own work rather. Um, so I've read some, some great new books. Um, I've read some classics that I never read. I, um, some classics that I reread, um, a lot of mysteries. Um, and really for me, the last time that I had a, a reading goal like this was was book karate in, in fifth grade, where I read 25 books for, for my black belt. Um, as of today, I've read 72 books. Um, and so my goal now is 100 for the year. So 
So um, right around book number 33, um, when I uh, when I heard about Richard Wright's uh, uh, new book, The Man Who Lived Underground, not a new book, but a, uh, a newly released book, I, I was very excited. I had read um, Black Boy and Native Son in college, and I was really excited about this, about this book. Um, and when I dug into it, a, a light bulb went off. Um, but for those of you who are uh, unfamiliar with this, this work, um, the book is a re-release of a of a shorter and edited version that was published in 1945. Um, and the story centers around Fred Daniels, a, a black man um, married and expecting a child um, who was picked up by the police um, after a, a, a double murder nearby where he was working. Um, and he is, um, he is beaten and tortured um, until he ultimately confesses to a crime that he didn't commit. Um, after signing a confession, Daniels escapes from custody and he, he flees into the cities. He flees underground into the city sewer system where he spends several days underground. And as days pass uh, and as Daniels loses track of time and a sense of where he is, his invisibility moves him into a kind of liber liminal space that liberates him, liberates him from, from racism, from the persecution, um, and for him, the facade of the American dream and gives him perspective, a perspective that enables him to, to kind of stand outside of the law and apart from his, his life above ground uh, and to see it with new eyes. Um, so there's, there's much more to talk about um, this book. And, and, and you know, I'm sure that, that, that we could have whole seminars on this. But what was especially useful for me was this notion as Wright shows us that his life, Daniel's life snaps into two, right? his world above ground and his world underground. And this, this really, for me, really kind of, I had this awakening and this zapped me back into kind of thinking around my own book and some of the parallels that, that, that my team and I had seen uh, and how the acquisition of DACA snapped people's lives into two. So lives of new, new lives of belonging and inclusion on one hand, but at the same time, an inability to escape their, their vulnerability. Um, so I, I, I really kind of picked up this idea of duality and I, I, and I ran with it. I, I, I kept seeing it over and over. And I, for my, my next book, book number 34, I intentionally picked up, um, uh, Milan Kundera's um, Unbearable Lightness of Being. Uh, I had seen the movie in college, and this was one of my wife's um, college books that was on our bookshelf, and I was interested in this, this duality of, of, of lightness and heaviness, but, but more so in this book, uh, really kind of as, as Kundera kind of waxes philosophical, um, he discusses Plato's Symposium, and, and accordingly, um, uh, People were, were, the original people were said to have, have, have been hermaphrodites um, with, with four arms, four legs, um, until the gods grew fearful of their eventual domination and decided to weaken them. So we see the manifestation of this idea of duality when Zeus, the Greek god of kings, decides to split them in two. Um, and so Kundera tells this story of how now these haves now wander the world seeking one another. Um, and for him, love, he suggests, is this longing for the half of ourselves that we, that we have lost. Um, in Roman mythology, we see Janus, the, the god of transitions and duality, uh, is typical, typically depicted as having two faces, um, looking opposite ways, one towards the past and other Towards, towards the future. Um, and then later um, by book 36, by coincidence, I, I came across uh, Britt Bennett's recent novel, The Vanishing Half. Um, and Bennett tells a story of uh, light-skinned African-American identical twins who grew up in the, in the Jim Crow South. So she plays out in the book, she plays out this very curious scenario 
So what if one of the twins, Stella, tries to escape the consequences of racism by attempting to pass as white? Uh, and in doing so, can could evade segregation, discrimination, and, and violence. Um, so from the, the moment her attempt in the book is successful, Stella's life splits into two. But the question for her, how long can she keep it up, is one that dogs her for several decades. So shifting this conversation now from the humanities to the social sciences where I'm admittedly uh, more comfortable. Um, so over the last several decades, um, social scientists like me have attempted to understand the processes by which different groups adapt and experience life in the United States. Um, so as, as sociologists studied the stranger, um, as, as George Zimmel would say, um, assessments of American assimilation as a, quote, almost natural sequence of interactions resulting in the absorption, modernization, and Americanization of foreigners, end quote, provided this optimistic narrative of linear progress. So as immigrants would slowly shift away from, and these are immigrants, um, uh, uh, Western and Southern European immigrants at the turn of the 20th century, shifting away from being Irish, German, Polish, Jewish, Italian, and would become American. So as the theory goes, they would shed much of their ethnic identity as they became, became Americans. So in, in Milton Gordon's Assimilation in American Life, published in 1964, he theorizes a set of stages that groups go through as they attempt to adapt. So Gordon built on earlier work of um, uh, Park and Burgess, their race relations cycle and, and Warner and Stroll's um, structural constraints concept to chart out this process that was unidirectional and positive, right? So for Gordon, attainment of the self image of an unhyphenated American was the endpoint to a process of successful assimilation. So later on um, in the, uh, uh, after the civil rights movement and in a, in a really um, uh, on the heels of massive demographic change in this country, um, Herb Gans, uh, another sociologist, uh, modified Gordon's earlier formulation by, by concurring with, by so agreeing with Gordon that groups would eventually acculturate and achieve what, what they were calling structural assimilation. But however, that with a caveat, that this process might happen in steps. So he referred to this process as bumpy, bumpy to capture the, the variation in processes and to illustrate that not for, that that not every group's assimilation process would be a smooth one. And then finally, Alejandro Cortez and his colleagues developed this segmented assimilation concept to illustrate three different pathways um, through which immigrants and their children journeyed, um, including uh, the possibility of downward assimilation. So these traditional um, and highly contested notions of how immigrants assimilate suggest that this is an adaptive process, which over time leads to social and economic merging with an American mainstream. These ideas also suggest processes which direct individuals on, as I mentioned earlier, a linear course from one social position, in most cases, to a better one. This is how we generally think about getting ahead in, in our society. Social mobility is often described in terms of pathways, escalators, or, or ladders. But the, the historical record is, is laden with examples that complicate this, this uh, assimilation narrative. So these examples that, that challenge this assumption of shedding 
right? And the point to tensions between institutional structures and human agency that assimilation theory cannot readily explain away. So we think of, we think of many examples. I have, I have three, three examples and I want to think, I want to talk about the, sorry. W.E.B. Du Bois's double consciousness, the, um, uh, the history of, of, of Mexicans and, and uh, uh, the, the paradox facing Asian Americans in this country. But for, for Du Bois, um, who was writing about the fractured identity of, of African Americans at the turn of the 20th century, he observed the black identity was constantly being filtered through a white lens. Du Bois believed that it was not possible to understand the identity and character of African-Americans through one singular black identity. For him, African-Americans had two separate frames of understanding that shaped their perceptions and actions in American society, their self-image as black and their identity as racialized Americans. We think about this assimilation story to be sure, you think about the, 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 the experience of Af African-Americans in this country who become in, in many ways in, in, in the language of assimilation have become acculturated, have become embedded, um, but, but still experience, um, experience a, a, a second-class status. Um, and then turning to the, this duality of the Mexican experience, it, we can best understand this through the historical tension between the long history of being sought out for their labor. In fact, the, 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 the story of Mexican migration is the, is the longest and largest uh, labor migration stream in the, in the Western hemisphere. Um, so, so integrated uh, through their labor, but socially excluded, uh, Mexican migrants and Mexican Americans alike have been long-standing targets of racial nativism that has repeatedly defined persons of Mexican descent as far foreign, legally, politically, and culturally, and has made it easier to frame them as outsiders and quote unquote illegal. And then, then turning to, to Asian Americans, on the other hand, who found success and, and, and thinking in particular of, of East Asians have found success integrated, integrating into the higher rungs of the US economy and certain cultural institutions, but have been similarly marked as racial outsiders, deemed not able to assimilate. Um, in her book, Mia Chuan, uh, in her book, Forever Foreigners or Honorary Whites, sociologist Mia Chuan argues that for many Asian American ethnic groups, their acculturation, their financial success, and their educational achievement endow them an honorary white status uh, in their personal lives. However, in their public lives, they're reduced to racial categories that construct them as non-white and as foreigners. So you see these three examples, we don't see, we don't see linear pathways. We see, we see duality, we see paradox, um, we see other things happening. So I want to turn to um, what we are, are we are conceptualizing as a kind of legal duality. Um, and so while scholars, uh, you know, there's a long history of, of trying to understand the, the, the stranger of understanding newcomers, scholars have long sought to understand these adapt adaptation price processes. Um, immigration policy has become increasingly consequential in shaping how immigrants and their children adapt, come of age, and experience life in the United States. Political entrenchment and increasing gridlock in Congress led to, has led to um, competing visions uh, for overhauling our, our US immigration policy. Or you, you, you poll uh, Americans, most Americans will agree that our immigration system is broken. Many would, would, would go as far to say that it is dysfunctional and it is that by design. Uh, but nevertheless, our, 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 uh, our lawmakers have experienced great difficulty passing immigration bills. Um, this is a very, very relevant um, 
uh, to, to today. Um, and the machinery that is US immigration policy has remained in this broken or, or dysfunctional state. So in absence of federal legislation, presidential administrations, um, we've seen how that looked, especially under Obama, how it looked under Trump, and we're getting an idea uh, under Biden. Um, these administrations had the dubious task of address, addressing immigration issues through administrative, not legislative means. So over the last three decades, two um, important measures have characterized US immigration policy. Um, first, uh, in the absence of legalization programs, the federal government has created a growing number of temporary time limited and partial immigration statuses. Think about DACA, think about TPS, and there's a whole score, a whole slew of other temporary policies uh, that don't endow citizenship and that can be taken away at any moment. Um, Cecilia Menhivar um, has termed these kinds of policies and this kind of positioning as a liminal reality, really challenging kind of our dichotomous uh, uh, conceptualization um, to highlight the, the gray areas between legal uh, and unauthorized categories. So these statuses, these liminally legal statuses like DACA um, provide important uh, means for access and inclusion, uh, but don't go all the way and their limitations are, are notable. So second, uh, beginning in the 1900s, there's, there's been a, a, a early 1900s, there's been a continual buildup of heavy immigration enforcement uh, resulting in a record number of, of deportations. And this enforcement has extended from, from our, our border through um, to our nation's interior. So we're talking about neighborhoods, public spaces, parks, um, bus stops. Uh, and this escalation of enforcement has meant that living with a temporary legal status is even more tenuous today, right? So in this context, living within the confines of a legal duality is laden with a measured hope, with a with, laden with a measured hope and real fear. So ultimately liminally legal statuses like DACA endow their beneficiaries with a dichotomous duality of both security and vulnerability. So instead of lying, but but we as we as we've thought about this, instead of lying somewhere in this gray area between legality and illegality, what we found with DACA beneficiaries is that they're experiencing both polar extremes and that they're moving back and forth depending on time, place, and situation. So they're feeling fully included in some spaces uh, and also fully vulnerable in others, right? So, um, so while one set of experience may be salient at a particular moment, the other never fully goes away. So instead of linear trajectories, upwards or downwards, beneficiaries' experiences are more like a seesaw. So we think about our childhood and that long, narrow board supported by a single pivot point midway um, between both ends, we might recall the sensation of moving up and down. Um, as one end of the seesaw goes up, the other goes down. Uh, and so for DACA beneficiaries from one moment to the next, they may be riding high due to successful career pursuits or a feeling of inclusion, but then come crashing down to the ground due to a delay in processing, a renewal application that leaves them out of status, uh, or a roadway encounter with law enforcement. Um, the rhythm may be slow and steady or abrupt and chaotic. Uh, the seesaw may move back and forth with regular consistency or stay stuck in one place for a considerable amount of time. So I wanna, wanna turn to, um, to our study 
um, very briefly um, from 2012 to 2019, um, I, um, I assembled a very large team. Lives in Limbo um, was really me driving the entire project. Uh, excuse me, here I'm supervising a, a very large team of 65. So in 2012, we, we, we carried out a national online survey. This was right at the beginning of DACA. Um, and at that time, uh, beneficiaries had really only had their status, many of them for, for a few months. So nearly 2,700 young adults, we carried out in-depth qualitative face-to-face -face interviews um, with nearly 500 young people, 408 of which were ultimately became DACA beneficiaries, um, 2015, 16, and 2019, um, in six sites in, in Phoenix, Arizona, and Los Angeles, California, Atlanta, Georgia, uh, New York City, um, Chicago, and Greenville, South Carolina. And so I want to um, go to what we what we learned. And again, this is this is really just just months after the receipt of DACA that that our uh, survey respondents were were uh, were taking giant leaps towards the American mainstream. Um, they were uh, again accessing new job opportunities. They were increasing their earnings. They were starting to build credit through opening up bank accounts. Um, credit cards, um, obtaining new forms of health care, um, passing driver's tests for, for driver's licenses. Um, so um, really this status almost overnight catapulting these, these young people in a very, very different, uh, different position, right? Um, the, the, the young women and men, men that we spoke to were also um, had experienced less fear in their everyday lives. Um, two thirds um, told them that they told us they were less afraid of law enforcement. Uh, about the same percentage also told us that they were less afraid of being deported themselves. Nearly 70% of them told us that they felt less stress in their everyday lives. Right? They also articulated a greater sense of belonging. Um, Jen from, from Los Angeles um, told us that, uh, uh, that it gave me hope that my future is not up in the air anymore. Um, Max from New York said, I, I, I finally feel like I'm part of the U.S., like I'm no longer living in the shadows. And, and Jenny from Chicago said, I feel like it saved my life. But for many of those we met, and I and 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 I want to stop actually stop here and say that um, it would not be a stretch to argue that this policy, this this DACA program, um, has been the most successful policy of immigrant integration in 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 the last last three decades or so in the United States. Um, but but for many of those we met, uh, the limitations of of their status loomed. Um, this is a status that uh, for beneficiaries um, uh, carries a, a two two year window and so at the end of every two years they have to they have to apply again. Um, and so here's Oscar from from Phoenix uh, describing this this uh, this feeling of always having to start from scratch. And Oscar tells us, he says, once you, once you have to renew it, the, the status that is, you, you have to start from scratch. Out of nowhere, just because two years are done, they treat you like you're nothing. You've got to go through the process all over again. That means that you could be fired or you could go without a job for a couple of months because you need to renew something that they already know that you have. And we met many young people who, over the course of their uh, of the time that we were we were interviewing them, had at some point fallen out of status, mostly to administrative error in, in processing. And for them, what that meant was, um, for many of them, having to leave their 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 place of work. Um, and for 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 many of those, um, oftentimes those jobs were never available for them um, once they were able to. Um, to secure their, their renewal. 
Um, the young people that we met also um, told us about this kind of new glass ceiling that they were experiencing as DACA beneficiaries. Uh, many of them, um, like, uh, like Esperanza, who I, I write about in Lives in Limbo, uh, who at the end, I, I, I write about her experience with DACA. She's, she's 31 years old by the time she got it. She had been working for, for several years. She had, um, she had a long line of low-wage jobs in restaurants and call centers and, and factories. Uh, but when it came time to applying for higher skilled work, she had a very thin resume. So many, many grappled with what it meant to, to, to lack the experience and not be competitive on, on a job market. Um, for many of them, um, while DACA for, for some periods of time, it's, it, it, it has started and stopped and um, they've been able to apply for what's called advanced parole and, and leave the country. Um, but that's not always a sure thing and, and it, it requires an application process. And so that is a deterrent for, for many um, uh, young people seeking work opportunities that require travel. And then there's, there's, there are barriers to occupational licenses. There, there are some 96 professions um, that require um, an occupational license. But DACA beneficiaries as a category of non-citizens are not eligible uh, for these licensed programs. And so many of them went through, went through programs only to be told in the middle of their program or even after completion of program that they weren't eligible for the license. Um, and then there are restrictions on, on government employment. So this real, uh, very real effect of this class ceiling um, placed um, extreme limitations on young people. Um, and then there's this, this constant fear um, of, of, of being picked up. Um, DACA um, provides a stay of deportation, meaning that it directs priorities and enforcement away from them. Uh, these young people are st still deportable. They still remain deportable. Uh, and so here's Eddie from Phoenix, um, who, uh, who told us that he had what he likened to uh, kind of PTSD. He said, I, I, I try not to think about being deported when it does happen, like saying I'm driving, I'm driving fine, driving the speed limit, hands on the wheel, 10 and two. Then I see a cop behind me, I think, was I speeding? Was I going five above the speed limit? Did I turn? When I turned, did I use a signal right? Is he looking at me? Is he looking at my skin? I think, am I gonna get deported if I get stopped? Am I gonna go to jail and then, then get deported? And if I do, do get deported, am I gonna get deported where I live or I used to live? Or are they gonna send me far away? They're gonna be like, oh, he lives over here. Let's send him over there. If he does stop me, is he gonna take my car away? Where's it gonna go? My mom, how are they gonna get help? All of that goes through my head. It affects me mentally, physically, and emotionally. Every time I read this quote, I get stressed out. It's a lot. This is a lot for young people to be contending with several times during the course of a day. And then we, we think about this, think about this seesaw and, and the spaces and places that may tip this either way. In the absence of federal immigration reform, we've also seen um, uh, localities, um, municipalities, counties, states, um, uh, try to come up with their own solutions to their immigration issues more locally. And what we've seen is really a, a, a uneven landscape of immigration policy and enforcement so that in certain places, um, in California, for example, um, undocumented immigrants and DACA beneficiaries have access to state financial aid and state tuition, driver's licenses, access to occupational licenses that's not tied to a DACA status. Um, but in, in, in South Carolina or, or Georgia, for example, um, 
undocumented immigrants are excluded from uh, in-state tuition. Um, uh, in Georgia, excluded from many of the state's top public universities, whether or not they have DACA status. Um, as I mentioned, the access to occupational licenses, while there are 96 in the United States that require an occupational licenses, states also have their own um, uh, uh, their own occupational licensing requirements. Um, and some states have passed bills permitting DACA beneficiaries to access these licenses, as I mentioned, California, while others haven't. And then navigating immigration enforcement, whether it be in a sanctuary city, um, sanctuary uh, university campus, um, or a, uh, a county that has uh, 287G uh, policies in place. And that those, those are um, enhanced cooperation, so really integration between local law enforcement and uh, federal ICE officials. Uh, and so where one lives today dramatically uh, shapes experiences of um, exclusion and, and belonging. And then um, if we look at if we look at DACA as a as a policy that has addressed a sizable and significant segment of a larger population, it is still a segment and a much smaller segment of, of, a, of, a, of a population. You know, we're talking about um, somewhere in the area now of 650,000 or more, I think that at the most about 820,000 young people um, have, have held a DACA status. Compare that with the larger um, population of 10 and a half million. Um, we see that there's a much larger population that is not covered, um, but is also vulnerable. And that the young people that we've met, um, who although they've been able to extend the benefits of their status to their family members, many of their family members remain vulnerable. Um, back to our survey, the survey of 2,700 young people, 70% um, of those that we surveyed said they knew somebody who had been detained or deported. And more than 65%, almost two thirds, um, that's a type of worry, all or most of the time that someone that they know would be deported. Um, you know, here's, here's Angela from, from Atlanta, very similar uh, to uh, an earlier quote. Um, Angela says, I'm, I'm always scared. What if my mother gets deported out of nowhere? What if my older sister doesn't fix her status? What's going to happen with her daughters? How's my brother-in-law going to take care of things? And how is he going to handle it? They're all very close. They, they live together. It's a lot of, there's still a lot of fear in my family. Um, so for, for many DACA beneficiaries, while this status has allowed them in many ways to soar, why it has given them wings, um, their roots have been also important in this story and important to them, um, I might add, but, but more so than ever before, these young people are tethered to, to family members. And uh, many of those that we've, we've talked to um, have told us that they, you know, with their status, they, they're paying um, their, and they're, many of them are very, very proud of this fact, paying extra shares of bills or rent or mortgage. So they're driving their parents um, to and, and, and from work or, or, or appointments. Um, and many of them are, are as, I, as I mentioned, are, are very proud of this, are very, very, um, feel a lot of pride in being able to, to impact their, their family and to help out their, their family members. Uh, but nevertheless, um, this status has also presented some, some, some new, new dilemmas um, for them. Um, and so um, for these young people, many of these young people um, are, are contending with a status that is renewable every two years, um, with a status that um, is on very shaky ground, um, in 2017, the Trump administration moved to terminate DACA. 
Um, that's been that's gone through the courts. Um, a recent um, court decision in Texas um, uh, put a stop um, to new applications. Um, and so for for many of these young people and their families, um, their futures um, look as as opaque as they as they were prior to 2012. Um, so thinking about this, Carlos from Phoenix, um, you know, really, I think really puts this um, in, in clear terms. He says that now my future is stressing me out because of who I am and what I don't have. What I have are problems. What I don't have is a solution for my future. Now I'm stressing out for my future, about my future rather, because it's not clear. And then Sujin from Los Angeles, she puts this crystal clear. She said, I feel like DACA changed my life. And remember the, the young person from, from Chicago earlier. She says, yeah, it changes life, but I don't know if it really changes the future for me. And that I think that is really profound. You got this policy that has allowed in the short term, really giant gains for young people, but it hasn't settled for them questions about, about the future. So many, many young people um, are, um, are living with um, this expiration date. And this expiration date could be their, the day of their, the, the expiration of their, their current DACA. If it's terminated or, or something, something happens to them. And here's Radha from, from New York. Uh, Radha told us it's, it's emotional because you, you learn to love a place and you learn to grow there. And then you're, well, any day someone can decide that that's not going to be your place. Uh, the fact that to a large extent, you don't have control, have control over your life. You can have control over what you want to eat today, maybe what shoes you want to wear. You don't have control over those big things that make a huge impact. And so as, as, as they say, as, as, as Rada said, it's hard to plan for things. So, so finally, I, I want to um, turn to this, this idea for, for these young people of imagining, but also planning for um, dual futures. Um, Jenny from Chicago. Um, told us this, she says in, in 10 years, and she's thinking about, she's thinking about her future plans. In 10 years, I hope to be some kind of elected official. She has high aspirations or at least run for school board. I'm working hard to get there, but it would definitely not happen if my immigration status didn't change. Leticia from, from Atlanta then tells us if it, if it does come to that, if it does come to her having to leave the country, what am I gonna do? Um, it'd be really hard to survive in Mexico, but if it happens, it's going to happen. So that's why I'm preparing for it, trying to save up. And I have a sister who lives there so I can go to that town, I can find a small apartment, maybe get her support for a little while till I can get on my feet. So what you see happening is that uh, these young people in, in crafting these dual futures, what they're doing is is thinking about and planning for a future that goes one way, but simultaneously thinking about and planning for a future that goes another way, a future in the United States uh, and a future outside of it. So, so what, what, what can we draw from, from all of this? And just, just to summarize, I, this is, a, as I mentioned before, arguably the, the most successful policy of immigrant integration in, in recent decades. Um, and so DACA as a semi-legal status, I'm, I'm thinking about another notable one, TPS or, or temporary protected status. So semi-legal statuses like this has given beneficiaries and their families a giant boost right, access um, to a set of rights that they didn't previously have. 
right? It's also powerfully shaped personhood and agency. Right? Full stop, I think that you, these, it's, it's very, very difficult to argue with, um, with these, these statements. But as policies that are administrative, not through legislation, the temporary and partial nature of them leaves many issues unaddressed. And it's created, as I mentioned before, some new dilemmas. Um, certain dynamics, as I, as I try to outline here, produce a very uneasy duality. So just as DACA beneficiaries occupy a legally ambiguous position, their access to the polity is often shaded and at times threatened by their sense of vulnerability. Um, while as a, as a semi-legal status, DACA offers some protection against vulnerability, um, the structural constraints rin, render that boundary porous and thin. Um, so um, we hope that, that, um, that through this work and, and, and through really trying to understand um, these these policies, these semi-legal, these legally liminal policies um, to contribute to a broader conversation about dualities um, that moves us from um, these kind of linear trajectories um, of, of American assimilation, um, but also in the policy sphere, moves us away from one size fits all policy that we can understand that um, uh, while structures can exert um, a, a powerful force on people's lives, their agency, and I wanna, I wanna end with this, their, their agency um, um, really helps them, their agency and their capacity, uh, their, their self-determination really uh, shapes um, uneasy, uneasy pathways. Um, my, uh, my wife teases me that I, I, I talk slowly and that I talk a lot. And so I want to uh, take this moment to, to thank you. Uh, thank you for, for, for joining me. It's been a pleasure and, uh, and I look forward to uh, Q and A. Stop sharing. All right, thank you so much, Roberto, for such a, a rich uh, presentation. And um, just a reminder uh, uh, to everyone, please submit your questions in the Q&A box. Um, okay, some questions are coming in, so, uh, and I'm very happy to moderate them. Um, all right, so the first question, Roberto, is, um, do we have to retreat from our reliance on the state for legitimacy, given its own geopolitical agenda that comprises rights of undocumented immigrants, uh, uh, compromises rights of undocumented immigrants and enforces border restrictions? It's, it's, it's a, a multi-pronged question. What is your opinion about sanctuary cities and providing an alternate model to the state's immigration framework? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a really good question. I think that, you know, I think that there's a, a, a really important debate in there and that is the, you know, the, the, the enduring power of citizenship. And I, you know, as I, as I alluded to at the end of the, the talk, I think that we, it's important to, to, to understand, uh, to, to fully embrace uh, people's agency, um, self-determination, uh, and to look at these places, spaces um, uh, of, of belonging uh, that immigrants themselves create and recreate in their lives. Um, but, um, and I think that there's, you know, there um, in, in Lives in Limbo, um, I, um, uh, I write a bit about kind of the, you know, we think about kind of, kind of, bigger kind of more kind of giant gestures of, of success or mobility and thinking about the kind of assimilation stories, but some of the, the, the most kind of powerful um, 
examples of, of, of agency and, and resilience and self-determination were young people who were carving out lives, um, raising families, uh, participating in their community, um, pursuing um, uh, hobbies that were not tied, ho hobbies and, and even uh, business pursuits that were not tied to their own immigration status. Um, but, but ultimately, um, these spaces also have limits. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing, we're seeing on the border what's happening to, to Haitians. Um, we've, we've seen over the last, uh, the last decade, um, enforcement that has ripped people apart from their families. And so this is a, it's a complicated issue. I don't want to say, I don't want to, I don't want to paint a overly structural story um, but the, 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 the nation state still exerts a tremendous amount of power. Uh, sanctuary cities, I had also mentioned sanctuary schools, I think are, are doing some really important work. Um, but ultimately, I think that people know that um, if an immigration official comes um, into a school, onto a campus like Penn's, um, that um, there is, there is uh, um, uh, uh, administrations, uh, the community um, has only so much uh, a, a recourse against that kind of the, the, those deportation orders. Yeah. Um, we have another question. Um, it reads, my DACA friends have had children here since achieving status. Should this be considered in in any uh, uh, in the making of new policy creation? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's a great question. You think about think more broadly at a population of ten and a half million people who are living in an undocumented residency status. Um, it's a it's a population of long term stayers. Vast majority have lived here uh, for more than fifteen years. Lived here, meaning living lived in the United States. Um, there are, are more than uh, now 17 million people who are living in mixed status families. Um, so you see that people have, have really grown roots in their communities. They've had children who are born here. And now we have a, 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 the a subsequent generation now of DACA beneficiaries who are having kids um, who are growing up here. And so how do we think about this when we we think about policy and, and what sort of immigration policy is just and fair. How do we think about these, these questions of how do we think about those who are long-term stayers and also have uh, family members, children um, who, who, in, in, uh, who know, know no other home? Um, it's, a, it's a really important question. Yeah. Um, we have another uh, question. It begins, uh... Thank you for this rich and insightful talk. Can you share your recommendations of what needs to be done by activists, but also by scholars, by us in the classroom, in light of these new racialized modes of semi-citizenship that the state has created? How do we challenge them, resist them, and undo some of their dispossessions in the face of the capitalist carceral state? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, another really powerful question, I think. And, and, you know, I think that, I mean, part of that is to contextualize what's happening in the United States in a kind of broader, um, uh, a broad, broader global world that we live in. And increasingly so, these statuses as, um, as, as nations are pushing back um, against formal citizenship, these 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 kind of semi legal policies are proliferating, right? So that what we are seeing in the United States is is just a is a is a sign of what is happening globally. And so, to be sure, there are there are huge limits on citizenship. And I think that you know my my discussion earlier on the experience of of African Americans in this country, especially. Um, who have full citizenship um, uh, legally, um, but 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 still um, uh, are still fighting for fighting against a kind of second class status. 
Um, so what it means is a really, re really rethinking citizenship and what it means and what it is, um, not only for nation states, but for, for communities, for, for, for families, for, for individuals. And how do we, um, how do we create something um, that is, uh, that again is just and fair. Uh, so thinking about activists and, 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 and scholars, and I think that, um, you know, I had a, had a, a, had a brief exchange with a reporter from, from the Boston Globe about uh, yesterday's march in Washington, DC, uh, Immigrant Rights March. And, and, you know, I think that what I'm seeing now, and I'm not, I, I'm not offering any advice. I don't think that I, I, I can or, or should offer advice to activists. Um, but I think that what we're seeing is a, is a, uh, um, for, for people who have been paying attention over the last 10, 15, 20 years, um, there's, there appears to be fewer divisions and a much more unified front. And I think that what we're, we're also seeing is um, a movement against a kind of one of Biden's promises was um, securing DACA, uh, fortifying DACA. But really, more than that, I think people are pushing. People are pushing against that and pushing for full citizenship and full citizenship beyond just uh, quote unquote quote quote unquote dreamers, but for a larger population that has been here. And I think that that's what I think that that's what we're going to see. We've seen we've seen many activists who have grown up in these move movements. Um, who have a lot of stake in these moment, these movements personally. Um, and I think that they are seeing this after, after four years of Trump policy and really an inability, I think, to organize against that president, um, potentially some, some openings with the Biden administration. Now his record has not been, uh, uh, his record has been mixed at best. Um, and, you know, we're seeing some images of, of what's happening with Haitians on the border. Um, but I think that people, people do believe that he is a president who can be organized against. All right. Well, this is actually uh, another question, but a uh, uh, good uh, compliments the one you just answered. Uh, the question is, is your research in influencing policy related to DACA and the legal pathway to citizenship? Uh, and what is your overall impact goal with your research contributions? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I, I didn't mention in this talk that I, um, prior to graduate school, I spent, I spent 10 years uh, in a Chicago community. I write about it in my uh, 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 preface in, in Lives in Limbo. But I spent 10 years as a youth worker and I lived in, and, and worked in, in, a, in a, a Mexican and Polish uh, immigrant neighborhood in Chicago, uh, where I started, I started to learn more from a kind of worm's eye view, uh, the, the kind of the experiences of immigrants, undocumented immigrants, those living in mixed status families, undocumented young people. And, and I, I, I mentioned that because the, those experiences, those early experiences in my kind of formative years after college really shaped the way that I, that I think about my research um, shape of the way that I think about um, uh, connections with research participants, how I think about partnerships, research partnerships, and how I think about um, what what research can do. Um, and um, you know, I've I've uh, I've been I've been very fortunate to um, to to publish my work and 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 for my work to be received well in in academic circles. Um, it has been my um, uh, my, uh, my 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 dual goal um, in academia of as we as as scholars do in 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 building connections um, uh, the social capital um, with policymakers uh, with with think tanks uh, with with community agencies. Uh, with a broad range of stakeholders, so that um, that I can leverage this uh, uh, this work to to contribute in a broader conversation. Um, and so I'm 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 really proud 
uh, of this work that's not, you know, this is not the kind of numbers that people people always want. Policymakers always want to kind of know numbers, and people write me all the time. Uh, what is the percentage? What is the economic impact of DACA? What has it done? But but I'm telling a more kind of nuanced and qualitative story, and I I'm very proud that that I've been able to um, to position myself. Um, and I, and, I, and I hope also others too, who are doing this work um, in front of, in front of policymakers, um, in front of Congress, in front of um, uh, uh, super, school superintendents, in front of um, uh, foundations, um, in front of, um, in front of uh, uh, social service agencies. And, and that's been, you know, that's been, uh, a real, um, for me, I think that has really, has been a real kind of mark of, of success. Um, can I say that I've changed immigration policy? No, of course not. I don't wanna be, I would never be that arrogant, but, but, but I hope that I've contributed to a conversation and, and been able to, 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 to shed some different light, to tell some, some different stories, to provide some nuance to, to the discussion. All right. Uh, we have several questions, but I think we have maybe time for two more, and I'll ask them uh, together. The first is, I mean, actually, you answered earlier that uh, activists are now thinking beyond the confines of DACA, but th 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 this question asks, though, what is a more egalitarian version of the DACA, of DACA, which both caters to the state's geopolitical necessities, but also foregrounds the interests of young immigrants without status? That's the first question. And then the second question, I think this is a, a great way of uh, uh, wrapping up the talk, is what's your next work? What are the big questions that have yet to be explored in the area of the undocumented experience that you plan to study and or hope others will? Yeah, so I, I, I um... I appreciate all questions, and, and I, I would I would uh, also encourage people who didn't get your questions answered to to, to shoot me an email. Um, we are, uh, as I mentioned at the onset of my talk, we're, we're 18 months into a, 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 a global pandemic um, that has affected us all. Uh, there's 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 no one here. There's no one that I know that has been untouched by this, mm -hmm. and so to have a conversation about immigration may be uncomfortable for some people because of the nature of the politics, but also because many people in this country are, 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 are hurting, are hurting economically. We've seen, um, we've seen uh, death and illness among lo loved ones, among coworkers, among neighbors. And so how do we think about, um, about policy that is, is fair and, and just is a really, is a, is a very important question. And a question that I think that we, we, we have to grapple with from, from all angles. And, and the way I think about it is this, is that the DACA has been important and it, and it has really shown us kind of the, the kind of natural experiment. What, what happens if we give these young people status? And we've seen, we've seen, we've, we've seen the results. But we've also seen that um, their fates are very strongly tied to their family members. And so we think about Think about a policy, and and I'm coming here from a a a, a frame of uh, of a social problem of inequality, um, and um, it's really it's really I think legalization, mass legalization that, that will raise um, at least most votes. Um, as I as I think to the future, I. This book is this book is now almost two years late to the publisher, and so I'm I'm working hard to do this. I'm also um, uh, uh, working with some colleagues on on uh, kind of issues in schools, um, and but I, I want to finish with this. We're in a really important time right now, and it's important to shine a bright light on what's happening. It's important for us to understand what's happening and the implications and consequences of this particular moment. However, it is also, it is equally important that we do not leave um, research partners, those who we're, 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 we wanna study, we don't exacerbate vulnerability. And so it's very important for all of us, whether we're teaching in a classroom, whether we're doing research on the community, 
whether we're advocating, we're doing advocacy work, um, not to put people in, in harm's way. Now, uh, you know, I'm going to take the prerogative of moderating, and I'd be remiss as a literary scholar not to ask you about all, how you set up the presentation and, uh, you know, uh, not to, uh, you know, literary texts and all this reading that you're doing. I'm wondering how it's informing your project. I mean, of course, narrative is central to Lives in Limbo. Right, the incredible ethnography that you do, the in-depth interviews. But I'm wondering, you know, just all this reading, how it's uh, helping shape this new project. Yeah, so it's it's been really fun, um, and in a way that I really had to walk the walk. I teach an ethnography class, and uh, for years um, I've been uh, uh, telling my students, you got to read more, and you got to read non-academic texts. You want to think about. You want to think about how writers establish a setting, how writers deal with dialogue, uh, how writers develop characters. We want to, you, you really, we really want to read widely and deeply and turn to literature. I had uh, Min Jin Lee in my class. She, uh, she visits my first, 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 our first day in the ethnography class at Harvard. Um, and she was, she was wonderful. Uh, but I think that, you know, returning to my book karate days <laughs> of the fifth grade, I'm really enjoying this. And um, I really want to, um, I'm really hoping that this, this reading is helping me to engage the text more deeply um, and to write in a way that is uh, to draw inspiration from some of these, you know, some of these, these, uh, these heavyweights, like like James Baldwin, for example, um, and to um, to to write about the characters um, that we've met through this project in in depth, in full dimension, in their complexity, um, and 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 I hope to to learn um, from 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 many of those works. Fantastic. Well. Thank you so much, Roberto, for such a rich uh, talk. And uh, we are all eager to see the final, the book in our hands. And, uh, and again, just a thank on behalf of the Wolf Humanity Center. Uh, thank you for helping us launch our, our season uh, uh, of programming. Um, uh, I also want to thank all of you for joining us uh, this afternoon. Uh, evening. Uh, we hope to see you again next week on October 6th for the next program on our forum on migration. The event is titled The Art of Migration with curator uh, Hur al Kasimi of the Sharjah Art Foundation and the director of the Sharjah Biennale and uh, our uh, Penn scholar uh, Sonal Kolar, uh, who's a professor uh, in the history of art department. Uh, thank you all again. Uh, many thanks, uh, Roberto, and uh, hope we will see you all next week.